God is making things happen in my life that I know that I didn't do it, God did it. None of us can take in the glory for whatever good that has happened in our lives. It was because of Jesus. Don't ever take the glory of who you have become, of whatever you think you are, it happened because of Jesus. God gave you the health, the strength, and even favor to get to where you are. And don't ever assume you got to where you are because of who you are. No, it was the grace of God that got us to where we are. And if we're going to go anywhere in this life, it's the grace of God that is going to take us there. You know, we are in the beginning of the year, and uh, uh, the theme for the year is the year 2013, the year of divine progression. Ephesians 3.20 says, that's the word of the Lord that came to me for this ministry for us. God is the God of increase. Yes, and then the Bible tells us this is the scripture that God put in my heart when he spoke to my heart. Ephesians 3.20. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we act or think. But it's according to the power that worketh in us. I'm going to teach you a few things this morning that will help you essential the rest of your life. God used to speak to us in ideas, concept, or insight. He's able to do exceedingly above all that we ask or think. It's according to the power. We know the power that he's speaking about there is the word and the spirit. If God's going to take you anywhere, the word has to be up front. The spirit and the word, they are synonymous. They work hand in hand. When you give place to the word, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or think. And I always remember, God used to speak to us through ideas, concepts, insight, through his word. I always learned that right here. Now, all of us desire to live the God kind of life. That's what you were saved for. Jesus said in John 10, 10, he said, I am come that you may have life. And that you may have it more in abundance. But the thief who was the devil, he came to kill, steal, and destroy. When you don't obey God's word, you disqualify yourself to the life of God. And the nature of Satan is to kill, steal, and destroy. And the nature of God is to give you a better life. That was the whole purpose of Jesus coming, to give us the life of God. To bring the life of God back into the earth today, that God's will would be done in earth as it is in heaven. Jesus made a profound statement to his disciples in Matthew 4, 4. And this is what he told them, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded forth out of the mouth of God. Because Jesus knew if the people didn't give place to the word, God could not fulfill what he sent Jesus for. Amen. So the word of God is essential to you and I because that brings us a new life. And then he says, him, Jesus spoke to his disciples in Matthew 7, 24, Say, so whosoever hears my word and doeth them is likened unto a wise man which built this house upon the what? Rock. You say the rains came, the winds blew, and the floods came and beat up on the house, but it fell not because it was founded upon the rock. Then he said, Whosoever hears my word and doeth this not is like a foolish man. The same attacks came, the rains, the wind, and the flood beat up on their house and Bible, the Bible said great was the fall of it because it was founded up on sand. So anything that's not built on the word of God is subject to the winds of adversity. And the winds of adversity will blow against it and blow it down. But Jesus said upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against this word. So if you're going to build a marriage, a church, a family, a business, build it on the rock. This is our foundation. This is our life. And everything that God would do in his life, he starts with his word. If God is in it, the word is out front. If Jesus is in it, the word is out front. And the devil knows if he can get me away from the word, he will set me up for failure and I will disqualify myself to the blessings of God. Amen. So tell your neighbor, start with the word. Stay with the word. And you'll end with the word. And at the end, you come out a winner. 
James, Jesus' brother, who learned these things from Jesus, said, Faith without works is dead. And faith is made perfect through works. Those works that he's speaking about is actions. Faith is not dormant. Faith is alive. Faith is action. When you hear the word and act on what you hear, life comes into what you hear. But if you hear the word and never act on what you hear, what? That word will be aborted. The key to the things of God is hearing and doing. When you hear the word, remember Hebrews 11, 6, for without faith, it is impossible to please God. But he or she that comes to God must believe. Believe what? That he is God. And that he is a rewarder of them what? That diligent seek him. So diligence is essential to the things of God. You just can't do it one time and expect to be blessed. God rewards the people who are consistent. Consistency is the key to your destiny. And you have to become a, do a doer of the word. I've been talking on tithing and offering, but I don't know if you're aware of it. But tithing and offering is stewardship. You know, when it's all said and done, we're going to talk about your money. Amen. God, the Bible has a lot to say about money. Amen. You, you know what? Uh, I like what, uh, this is what we've been talking about, Dave Ramsey, and we're doing his program here at this church. This is what Dave Ramsey said. He said, your priorities, your passions, your goals, and fears are shown clearly in the way you handle your money. So God knows that. The secret to knowing a person is find out how money. See, money can be either a tool or a master. If, it's, if you're controlling it, it's a tool. But if it's controlling you, it's a master. And when money controls you, it will get you out of the will of God. And God wants us to learn. You've heard me say this more than one time. People don't have money problems. They have management problems. I don't care how much money you get, you'll not get enough if you don't learn how to manage where you are. Amen. So the first thing I have to do is to prove to God that I'm going to follow his word and manage what he allowed to come into my life. Yes. Now go back. The tithe is the tenth. They're ahead of me. The tithe is the tenth. One tenth of everything that comes into my hand. Belongs to God. Amen. You can't get around that. I don't care. You can argue all day Amen. about you don't believe in tithing. You know the reason you don't believe in tithing? You're tight. Amen. Or you let a dime choke your destiny. Amen. And what you're saying, God, I don't trust your word. Amen. But so you're going to argue all day. You're arguing with God. I'm just going to tell you what God has to say. God established the tithing. And it's a tenth of everything. We tithe everything that comes into this church. The house of God, the church, is ran off the tithes and offering. But well, one tenth of everything that comes into this church, we put it in a mercy account. And we sow it through our benevolence, through our missions, and everything. Tithe into tithe. But I am a tither. And as you heard me say, I learned about tithing before I got saved because I grew up in a home. Where they tithed. My parents, I'm a preacher's kid. And my parents taught me earlier about the importance of tithing. Because you teach what you know, but you produce what you are. I don't care how much you tell your children, they're going to learn more about what they see than what they hear. So the preacher didn't have to argue or fuss with me about tithing because I knew the importance of it. And if you're wise, you will learn the importance of it. Whatever God say do, tell your neighbor, I'm just going to do it. And that's where miracles begin. The contents of your character is demonstrated by the way you choose to spend your money. And God knows that. And God knows if he don't have your heart, money would drive you away from God. Because if you're a little fool with 10 cents, you'll be a big fool with a dollar. Well, you got to be honest. Because all money would do is amplify who you really are. So God said, I must change your attitude towards money before I take you there. Right. Y'all ain't got quiet on me. <laughs> See, God makes us stewards. 
So a steward, notice that next statement there. A steward is a person who manages another person's financial affairs. And God has chosen you to be a steward. Isn't it good to know that God trusts you with certain affairs? You know, the Bible says in Psalms 24, verse 1, the earth is the Lord and all the fullness thereof. Satan took the earth from Adam, but Jesus, the second Adam, came to restore back to man what the first Adam lost. And then he tells us in Psalms 50, verses 10 and 12, God said, the beast of the forest is mine. He said, the cattle on the stout thousand hills is mine. And then he tells us in Haggai 2, 8, he said, the silver is mine, the gold is mine. God created everything in the earth for his glory, for his family. Satan stole it from the first Adam. Jesus being the second Adam came and established the truth in the earth. And when we abide according to his word, we take back everything that the enemy has stolen from us. Now let me say that if God's going to take you there, you have to become a student of his word. If God's going to do anything in your life, it starts with his word. That's what Jesus meant when he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded forth out of the mouth of God. So we need to know that I am a steward, you are a steward, but the question is, how much can God trust us with? That's what it comes down to. How much can God trust you with? See, lab I am on trial. Whether you accept it or not, you are on trial. Now we have to prove ourselves to God that he can trust us. And it starts with that 10 cent. One dime out of a dollar. It's you tied to God. That's all he asks. He don't ask for the whole dollar. He says, give me mine. 10 cent out of a dollar. That's what the tithe is, one ten. Tell your neighbor, don't let a dime choke you. <laughs> don't let a dime choke your destiny. Don't let a dime take you to the, don't let a dime disqualify you to where God wants to take you. Who will fuss over a dime? But some of you do. Notice what God stated there in Leviticus 20, verse number 30, uh, Leviticus uh, uh, 27, 30. He said, all the time, not some of it, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. You know, men will fuss with their wives over tithing, but they'll pay, spend $10,000 over a fishing boat. And that fish ain't going to take you where God's going to take you. Because your heart is in that fish. But you get mad at your wife because she chose to give God what is rightfully his. And the reason you will pay $10,000 for a fishing boat and fuss over your wife giving God what is rightfully his, you love that fish over God. That fish has become your God. Because if you locate where a man spends his money, you'll locate his heart. You thought I heard you and your wife fussing last night, didn't you? <laughs> but God said, all the tithe is the Lord's, but the tithe is holy. And don't touch that which belongs to God. You can't choose what you're going to do with the tithe. You can't give it to your aunt or your uncle who's in trouble. The Bible said the tithe come to the house of God. Why? Because God's house is ran through tithes and offerings. We're competing with the world to build a house that God's name will be glorified. And the people in the world are building houses that the devil's name will be glorified. And when you look at the state of the world versus the state of the church, it appears that the world has an advantage upon God because the world has a... They, they, I mean, they do things in a big way. Yes, now, you know, let's be honest. Today is Super, Super Bowl Sunday. Yeah. And I like football. I like sports. And the Ravens will win today. Yeah. All you 49er fans, eat your heart out. The Ravens will win today.
But you know what? They were spending mega bucks today. I mean, they were spending mega bucks today because the world does it big, man. And won't nobody say a word. But when the church tried to do things right, everybody start murmuring and complaining. And we're competing with the world that God's name will be glorified. And God said in Malachi 1, 3, from the rising of the sun to the going down of Satan, 1, 11, he said, my name shall be glorified amongst the heathen. This is a house that we will equip people to serve God. And we should not build God a second class house. You won't build a second class house for your house. You want the best for your life. So why don't you give God your best so that God can in turn reward you with his best. So tell your neighbor, all the tithe is the Lord's. And don't never forget, the tithe is holy unto the Lord. And didn't know this there in Malachi 3, verses 8 through 11? He said, will a man rob God? Ooh. Yet you have robbed me, but you say, in what way have we robbed you? God said, in tithes and offering. Here's God talking about robbing. Robbing God? But notice what happened when you take away that tithe. Verse 9, he said, you place yourself back under curse. Christ redeemed us from the curse. But when you stop obeying God's command, you put yourself back under that curse. Do you not know everybody in the world is living under a curse? Amen. Don't ever think money is the answer to your problems. Money can bring you more problems. Because the Bible says in 1 Timothy 6.10, the love of money is the root of all evil, and you will find many evil and sorrows around money. And God knows that. But when God, but the Bible says in Proverbs 10.22, the blessings of the Lord makes us truly rich and adds no sorrow to it. The sorrow comes with that in the wealth in the world, but when God bless you, no sorrow comes along with it. So you want to go the path of righteousness for his name's sake, that as God bless you, sorrow won't come along with it. Are you there? And then you say, when we don't bring that tithe to the house of God, we put ourselves back under the curse. And when you're back under the curse, Satan has dominion and authority over your life. And what happens? You have bad marriages, bad relationship, sickness and diseases take you out. Don't ever think the answer to your dilemma is more money. No, the answer to your dilemma is a relationship with God. Because I know a lot of people who have money, but their life is ragged in a bowl of crap. That's why they smoke up, dope up, and sex up, trying to find some peace. But you're not going to find peace in sex, dope, alcohol, drugs, and even in another person. It can bring you temporal happiness, but it can't bring you eternal joy and peace. Only, lust can only bring you temporal happiness, peace. And the Bible says, I'll keep them in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed upon me. Don't ever think everybody who has money is happy. They'll just trade just 10 minutes of your peace. That's why they go from marriage to marriage. That's why the divorce rate is so high. Because see, when lust get one, after two months, they want something else. Because you can't satisfy lust. I leave nothing alone. But I don't want to live the rest of my life under no curse. So I'm going to choose the path of righteousness for his name's sake that as God rewards me, I don't have to worry about the sorrow that comes along with it. But then notice what he warned them again in verse number 10. He said, bring all the tithe into the storehouse, which is the church. Well, if there may be food or meat in my house, which is the church. And then God said, and try me, approve me now 
and this said the Lord of hosts. You know, the Bible tells us in Romans 12 too that we are not to be conformed to the world, but we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, proving what that is good and a love, but good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So you have to prove yourself. Didn't he tell us in Ephesians uh, 5 10, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord? Every man, every woman here will have to prove yourself unto God. I will, you will, even the church. If God's going to take us there, we have to prove ourselves to God that we can manage our affairs, manage, be good stewards over what God has entrusted us with. Before God takes you there, you've got to learn how to manage where you are. You don't need two children if you can't manage one. You don't need a house full of children if you can't manage one. You want another marriage and haven't learned how to manage one you're in right now. Don't give somebody your troubles. We're famous for asking God to give us things that we're really not ready for. Are y'all ready for me? God said, bring all the tithes unto the storehouse of the church that there may be food or meat in my house. And he said, prove me now. And just said the Lord of all. And then notice he said, when you prove him, when you prove to be faithful, next, he said, I will open unto you the windows of heaven and pour you out blessings. And there would not be room enough to receive. You know, God opened up the windows of heaven with Noah and it started raining. And it flooded the earth. Now God said, I want to flood you with blessings to the point that you not have enough room to receive, but you got to prove yourself to God. When the word of God becomes a part of your character, you're proving to God you're ready for success. It's just not doing the right thing one time that qualifies you. But when the right things becomes of your decision making, when you turn to the word, what would God do in this situation? When doing right is a part of your character, you're letting God know that you are ready to go there. And that's what God watches over his word to see how we're going to respond to his word. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 16, 9, the eyes of the Lord runs to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on the behalf of those whose heart is perfect to watch or matured or committed to watch him through his word. Amen? A lot of you guys want God to take your places you're not ready for yet. But God said, when you prove yourself, notice that next verse he said, he said, man, he said, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Yes. This is what God is saying. And he said, he will, the devil will not destroy the fruit of your ground. Now shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you at the right time, say the Lord of hosts. This is God talking. Say, prove yourself. Prove to me that this will be a part of your decision making. Prove to me that you'll put me first. Prove to me that you're committed to my righteous cause. Prove to me that you favor my righteous cause. You know, if you got too much, if I can't manage you with $10, man, if you got $100, You want my position, my title, but you ain't getting it because you didn't get called to it. <laughs> See, you got to prove yourself for God to take you there. You got to prove in the house of God, you got to prove yourself. God said, never promote a novice. See, if you promote a novice, you get lifted up in pride. And he thinks somebody should be pra praising him. That's what happened to Satan. He got promoted. He was beautiful. He was gifted. He was talented. Isaiah the 14th chapter, around verse 12. He was gifted. He was talented. And he wanted to exalt himself above God. He wanted people to worship him. And as a result, he got kicked out of heaven. Because he got a promotion that he wasn't mature enough to handle. Are you matured enough to handle the next level? How you proving to God that you're ready for the next level? Good 
Notice what that bullet said. Say, will a man rob God? Woo! I don't want to hang around a God robber. Maybe we need to put an angel out there somewhere. And, and every time a God robber went through the door, it's a God robber, God robber, God robber, God robber. Watch out, you're taking up off. You got a God robber here. And anybody that robbed from God, they're bold. We have a section for the God robbers over there. So we can keep our eyes on them. Put guards all around them. <laughs> Ask your neighbor, so who are you? Don't tell them, don't tell them that you've been taken from God. But the Bible asked them, say, will a man rob God? See, Israel did not know that they had quit giving honor to God with that tithe and offering. See, their father stopped doing it, so the children stopped doing it. And God said, the whole nation has stopped rewarding me and honoring me with that holy tithe. And they didn't know it. They didn't know that because they were under a curse, they couldn't defeat their enemies. And they went to God wondering, why are we not able to defeat our enemies? Where are the miracles that we heard about? We don't see miracles any longer. We don't see signs and wonders any longer. So what's up, God? Why don't we see miracles? Why don't we see signs and wonders? And God sent him to him and said, will a man rob God? And he said, where have we robbed you, God? He said, in tithe. And say, when you stop giving to God, you have no might, you have no strength, you have no authority, you have no ability against your adversaries. But God said, when you honor me, he said, I'll rebuke the adversary for you. He said, I will pour out blessings or dare not be room enough to receive. But you got to prove yourself. Notice that next bullet I tell your neighbor, God considers it personal robbery. When one of his children refuses to bring tithes and offerings to the house of God, you have robbed God. Never let a dime control your destiny. And in that next bullet, notice what it says. See, so you robbed God of the, one of his greatest pleasures, his personal pleasures he get from blessing his servants, his sons and daughters, when we obey his commands. The greatest joy that God gets is when we make his commands, his statutes, his concepts, his word a priority in our life. You're like that. I know I'm like that. When I give my children a command and they honor that command, there's nothing I wouldn't do for my kids. I go through hell and back with them. When I know I have told my children the right thing to do and they don't argue and fuss over, just do it. Man, I war. I fight every devil in hell. But when they ignore and fuss over it, I said, let them get slapped upside the head two or three times. That's like that. God, you know, God said, well, if I give you a command, what you going to do with it? I guess God a little bit more merciful than I am. But God's greatest pleasures it's the prosperity of his servants. The blessings of the Lord makes us truly rich. And that's no sorrow with it. Are you there? Notice that scripture say, make it rich. Like making a cake. Make it. That's a process. My wife knew that I was going to be watching the ball games today. So she made me my special food for the day. I'm going to tell them. What my favorite food is for the Super Bowl to watch the Raiders beat up on the 49ers. Yeah. She asked me, say, JC, what do you want for Sunday? You know what I told her? Some pinto beans. <laughs> some cornbread. Yeah. Some potato salad. Yeah. And some hot chicken wings. Man, I would get down the stairs in my chair. <laughs> I 
that's the way God is. God's greatest pleasure is when we obey his command. He said, what do you want? Because the Bible says, if we delight ourselves in the Lord, he'll give us the desires of our heart. No good thing will I withhold from them that walk up rightly before me. So you got to get rid of that myth that God is tight. And God won't take you there. The whole purpose of Jesus coming, that we may have the better life. But it comes through submission through his word. Tell your neighbor, notice that statement there, God wants you to prosper. Get rid of that myth that God gets pleasure out of you being poor. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, a poor man's wisdom is not received. So if God, if the people are going to listen to what we have to say, God will have to change our lifestyle. If people won't listen to a poor man, why would God keep you poor and tell you to preach the gospel? People want to listen to people who have proven what they have to say. You know, I told you guys what Bishop Jake said. Bishop Jake said he had this young man in his church. And he had been to seminary, got his doctorate degree. And he thought Bishop Jake should put him up on a pedestal, up on a pedestal of the podium to talk to his people because he had his degree, his doctorate. But Bishop Jake simply told him, say, young man, I admit that you have been to school and you have earned your doctorate. He said, but you don't have an earned the right to speak until you have proven what you have learned working. He said, when you're able to produce the fruit of what you have learned, that's what gives you the right, or earned the right to be heard. I mean, the people of the world been to school. What earns us the right to be heard when we have proven Amen. that what God said and we're producing the fruit of it. Yes. That's what qualifies you. Yes. I don't want to hear what I got to say, but I'm going to tell it in half. Yes. And when we're able to shut down yes. and learn and put faith in what we have learned so that God can give some fruit so that the people of the world will know that, hey, they got something going for them down there. Notice what the Bible stated there in 1 Corinthians 3, 9. We are labors together with God. If God's going to take you there, you've got to put him out front. And how do I put God out front? Through the word. I put the word first. Tell your neighbor, put the word first. God should have preeminence in everything. I mean, everything I do, I put the word out front. I'm following the word. I'm obeying the word. I'm being led by the spirit. Because we all labor together with God. God got us to where we are. And if you'll follow me as our Father the Lord, you'll be amazed at where God will take you throughout the year 2013. But it won't stop at 2013. It'll take you on into 214, 250, 216, and the rest of your life. Because everything God starts, his intention is to continue it for eternity. God said, even when I leave, my children should keep the ball rolling. Your children should keep the ball rolling. And every generation should take it to another level. Never forget this. Hey, notice, let me close this out. Finish up. God gives you your hands power to get worth. That word power means ability. God gives your hands, gives you the ability to get well. You know, I, there, there's something God, I, maybe I shouldn't say it, but the Lord's been dealing with me about the hidden riches in secret places. There are wealth out there, there are hidden things out there, that are, everything of value is hidden to the, nature, na, to the natural eye. But it's not hidden from God, and God's been dealing with me about that. And I don't want to get into that, because I'm still studying it. The hidden riches in secret places. The wealth of the sinner is later for the just. So if it's later for the just, I want to know how to come get, how God wants us to get. And he'll reveal it unto us, and he's teaching me, and I'm going to come back and teach you later. Tell your neighbor, 2013 is a year of divine progression. Tell your wife, say, baby, stay with me. God is taking me places. Now watch this right here. This is very, very important, guys. God is taking us places. Doors are being opened. You know, I, I was uh, yesterday in our intercessory prayer, 
My, my son, Jason, my son, Jason was leading prayer. There's such a strong anointing on Jason when it comes to praying. He said something that I, it didn't register to me when it happened. During my anniversary, the mayor, Mayor Alan Jones, who's a friend of mine, he came here and he gave me the keys to the city. Hallelujah. And this is what Mayor Jones said. He said, I've been the mayor 11 years. I've been, how many years was it? Was it 11 years? He said, I've done this a few times. I don't know for sure, but I might be the only pastor in the city who have the keys. Yeah. Now what I saw in this right here, if he gave me the keys to the city, that means we have rights. So we need to start thinking like we have rights. There are doors that are open for us to come. And we need to enter into those doors. And I'm going to talk more about that later. But tell your neighbor, this church have rights to the city because the mayor gave us the key. Probably after that, every pastor in the city going to want a key. Well, I leave that alone. I let the mayor deal with that. But the Bible says God gives us power to get wealth. But the question is, how much can God trust you with? Have you proven yourself to God that he'll take you there? And notice, let me move on. Notice in Deuteronomy 8, verses 17, 18. Then you say in your heart. Notice this is how people talk. My power and the might of my hands have gained me this way. This is the way people think of my title, my degrees, who I know has got me to where I am. That's normally the way people think and don't know God. My might, my power, my hand, my ability got me to where we are. Only a fool would think like that, but we get foolish sometimes. And God heard that. So you got caught up in yourself. You got caught up in your gift and your talent, but God gave you those gifts. God gave you those talents. God gave you those abilities. And we want people to praise us. And when people don't praise us, we take an offense. And God heard it. But notice what God stated there in verse 18. Verse 18, this is what God said. And you shall remember, it was the Lord your God. For it is he who gives you power or ability to get well. Wow! That he may establish his covenant. Which you swore to your fathers. As it is, that's why you bring the tithe. That's why you bring the offering. But there may be me in the house of God. And all God said, just give me what is mine, my tithe. And give me an offering from your house. He said, the tithe is already mine. He said, I gave you the ability to get that job. I gave you the ability to make a dollar. I gave you the ability to get to where you are. Now you want to say, I did it. And you won't give God what is rightfully His. You withhold from God, but you want God to bless what you are doing. But God said it was my favor on your life. He said the enemy tried to take you out, but I withheld, withheld death from your house. I withheld death from your family. I withheld death from your business. I withheld death and poverty from your life. God said, I was the one that got you to where you are. You didn't get that on your own. He said, I was the one that stood up for you. I was the one that held back there. I was the one that kept you alive. I was the one that kept you soon. I said, don't you get the big head on me because you got two suits, two dollars, and two cars. He said, when you had one, you gave me glory, praise, and honor. But you messed around here, got two suits, two dollars, and two cars. You got the big head, and you begin to think it was my might, my hand, my power, my ability that got me to where I am. He said, when you didn't have anything, you stayed in the church. When you didn't have anything, you prayed all night and all day, and even you fasted. So you mess around and got two dollars, two suits and two cars. I had to beg you to come to church. I had to beg you to read the word. I had to beg you to do what is right. I'll leave that alone. Tell your neighbor, God gave me the ability to get where I am. 
you know, God give people gifts and they want to prostitute those gifts. I'll play in the church if you give me two dollars. God gave you that gift, but you want to prostitute it. I'm not going to play if you don't give me two dollars. I'm not going to preach if you don't give me two dollars. I'm not going to sing if you don't give me two dollars. My wife told me, smell more. I cannot smell. That's my bulldog figure. That's when I get serious. Don't you never tell God I'm not going to do it if you don't give me $2. Because if you got your $2, you got your value. But if you sow it as a seed, the Bible says God gave every seed a body. And only God knows the potential of a seed. Tell your neighbor, let's sow a seed, sow a seed. When you tithe it, you're sowing the seed. When you give an offering, you're sowing the seed. When you work in the house of God, you're sowing the seed into your destiny. Everybody in the church ought to be if you're singing, if you know how to sing. Taking your gifts and giving your gifts and your talents back to God. God shouldn't have to beg you to give back to him what he gave to you to get you to where you are. You got people prostituting the gifts that God gave them. Because they got the spirit of the world. Because the world charged for everything. But the Bible says, blessed to give. Give and it shall be given unto you. Living to give and giving to live is what produces the life of God. That makes one be. Tell your neighbor, God gives you ways to prosper. He gives you witty adventure, ideas, concepts, insight that's going to take your place that no one can take you but God. Notice that scripture right there. Proverbs 8, 12. I wisdom, this is God talking. Dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty invention. And what prudence means foresight, forethought. God looks into the future. He is wisdom. God is cautious. God is judgmental. He uses wisdom looking ahead to prepare you for what is coming. A man or a woman of God, the wisdom of God is never caught by surprise. And the Bible says, get wisdom, and above all that, get, get understanding. When you do it God's way, there won't be no fame in your house. It's I have wisdom, I dwell with prudence, foresight. He said, I see things men don't see, I know things men don't know. You got to trust somebody. You're going to have to trust what they're saying on NBC, CBS, or ABC, CNN, or MSNBC, wherever your favorite network is, or you're going to trust the Bible. I'm going to trust God. Let me close with that. See, tell your neighbor, God teaches you how to make a prophet. This is God talking. He said, I teach you. I give you the ability to get wealth, and he said, I teach you how to profit once you prove that I can trust you. Why would God give you something and you're going to blow it in the world to promote the devil? Why would God elevate you to another level and you'll use what God gave you to promote the devil? That's why I don't believe in parents leaving an inheritance for their children if they're not saved. If God gave it to you by the way of the word, if your children are not saved, give it to the church because all they're going to do is blow it in the world. Don't give a child something that don't reverence God. Don't give a child money that don't honor God. Because if they got it, they will blow it in the world. I know y'all don't like what I got to say, but I'm going to tell it in the house. That's just like a child. A child don't need a car if they don't honor your commands. They don't need a cell phone if they don't honor your commands. Notice what God said to that in Isaiah, 4, in Isaiah 48, 17. Thus said the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Notice what he said. I, the Lord, your God, who teaches you to profit. This is God talking. Who leads you by the way you should go. This is God telling you and I what he will do once we prove ourselves that we can, uh, he can trust us. 
He wants you to have it. He wants you to prosper. But you got to prove yourself first. That once you get there, you won't be high-minded, proud, arrogant. Notice what he stated there in num number D. Giving of tithes and offering is the first step in godly prosperity. If God's going to take you there, you got to follow his word. He gave us a word. Tithe is important to God. It belongs to God. Offering represents your have. The tithe is automatic to God. And you don't ever think that you can get around tithing and offering and God's going to take you there. Now, you can go by the way of the world with the curse, but if you go by the way of God, it's without the curse. Notice what he said to that in Luke 6, 38. Give and it shall be given unto you. How? Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Shall people put it in your, give unto your bosom. Notice he said give and it. The word, let's qualify the word it. It could be anything. It could be money. It could be strife. It could be gossiping. It could be division. Whatever you give out will come back to you later. I don't care whatever that it may be. It could be a number of things. Money is just one of them. But what he is saying that whatever you sow, you will reap. If you sow evil, you will reap evil. If you sow good, you will reap good. Whatever man soweth. Don't ever think you can do wrong and get away with it. Life is like a boomerang. What you do today will meet you tomorrow. And I've learned it so I won't do something that I don't want to reap later. I won't talk about people if I don't want people to talk about me. I will do unto people like I want to be done to myself. Treat people like you want to be treated. Obey God's command so he can follow through with what he said. Because he said, as you sow, give whatever you give. It will come back to you. And it always come back more than what you gave. And some of you guys get mad because when it comes back, you're not ready for what you sow. That's close. This is my second closing, right? I got two more. Trust me, if anybody in this house is counting them, my wife is counting them. Hallelujah. Rob, is that the way Liz do you? She counts you closing? Do your wife count your closing? I got a counter in this church. She sits right there. And she reminds me, you close four times, five times, six times. That's number two, babe. Okay. But don't ever forget that. Whatever you sow, it will come back to you. If you mean to your wife, it will come back to you. If you mean to your husband, it will come back to you. If you just mean to everybody, it will come back to you. If you're sarcastic and don't want to go along, it will come back to you. You don't want to follow the vision? It will come back to you. I need to qualify that it. It could be anything that you sow. It will come back. If you're so good, it will come back. If you're so wrong, it will come back to you. If you gossip about others, it will come back to you. Don't be, so quick, don't be so quick to let it out of your mouth. Don't be so quick to let it come out of your hand. Because it always come back, good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over. But with the same measure that you meet, it will be back to you later. Yes, 
I don't know why people think they can be mean with their companion in this relationship and get another relationship and think it's going to be pleasant. That's my windshield wipers. Cling on your eyes and your ears so you can hear whatever you so tell your neighbor. It will come back to you later. Okay, tell your neighbor. And, all right, let's close it up. Number three. <laughs> God is looking for cheerful givers. Second Corinthians 9, verses 6 to 8. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall also reap sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Verse 7. Every man as he purpose in his heart, so let him give. This is talking about an offering here. Not gradually or of necessity, for God loveth it what? Yes. Your tithe and offering shall be the most joyful time of the service. As we spoke last Sunday, tithing and giving with joy. Because you know that you got a good future. In verse 8, and God is able to make all grace abound to want you that you have an always sufficient, sufficiency in what? All things. The grace of giving produces the better life. Now, here this scripture is talking about giving. It's not talking about tithing, it's talking about giving. The tithe is automatically God. But this offering represents your house. Tithe and offering. The tithe is holy, the tithe is law, which is 110. Now, I give an offering representing my life, representing my house. But God said, do it joyfully. Not begrudging, but just do it because God said, do it. Amen. Now, <laughs> one more time. Tell your neighbor, stewards must be faithful. I am a steward. You are a steward. We're all stewards of what God has entrusted us with. And if God's going to take us to the next level, we've got to be faithful to where we are right now. Notice 1 Corinthians 4, verses 1 and 2. That a man so consider yours as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Tithing and offering is stewardship. How much can God trust us with? You have to prove yourself right where you are. But notice what he said there in verse 2. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Simply meaning, that bullet there, this simply means, the bullet freeze, sweetheart, this simply means that faithfulness is not optional. Well, maybe later. You're just holding up your destiny. And that second bullet, there is no option when it comes to faithfulness. You know what the Bible says? Confidence in an unfaithful man is like a broken tooth out of, or an anchor out of joint. When you prove yourself not to be faithful, it's unpleasant to have a servant or someone who's not faithful. But then the Bible tells us in Proverbs 28, 20, a faithful man or a woman will abound with blessings. God rewards the faithful. He's a faithful God and keep his covenant. And when we're faithful to his covenant, he rewards us accordingly. Amen? Amen. And my last scripture for the day, guys, is right there. Notice, tell your neighbor, everybody stand on your feet for a minute. I want you to grab a hold to this. Say it. Let them shout for joy and be glad who favors my righteous cause. Let them say continually that the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of it. Say it again. Let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of it. Say it again. Let them shout for joy. Say it again. Let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause. Let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified who has pleasures in the prosperity. Say it again, let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. And let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure. Stop your feet. Stop the other one. Jump up and down. Now let's say it again. Let them shout for joy that favor my righteous cause. 
Let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified who has pleasures in the prosperity. So the secret to this life is favoring God's righteous cause. And when you favor God's righteous cause, you ought to say continually, let the Lord be magnified who has pleasures in the prosperity of his servants. I want every business person to walk down here at this front. Every per if you own a business or desire to own a business, walk down here right now. What I just not taught you is essential if God's going to take you there. You can't get there on your gifting and maintain a stable stand. If God's going to take you anywhere, he was stored with his word. And your response, listen to me, your response to his word will determine where he's going to take you. You've got to prove yourself to God that you're ready for success. Pride goes before the structure and a hardest spirit before a fall. God's not going to reward you if you've got a hardest spirit where you can't take corrections. The Bible says the meek shall inherit the earth. A meek person is a teachable person. A meek person is one who will listen. A meek person is not arrogant, heady, high-minded, get caught up in his own ability. A meek person knows that wherever I ever would be in this life, I got there because of God. You will have to prove yourself to God before God take you there. And you know how you will have to prove yourself to God? Right where you are. The Bible says it's the little foxes, the little things that kills the vine. Those little commands that he gives you that you ignore will disqualify you for the better thing that he will give you later. Hallelujah. And I'm going to say this for what it's worth. Some of you guys need more of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. And you don't have to be perfect to get the Holy Ghost. Matter of fact, if you're not perfect, you need more. You need the Holy Ghost. Because that's the whole purpose of the Holy Spirit coming to take an imperfect man to bring perfection to an imperfect man. And all of us have our imperfection, but the Holy Ghost moves when there's obedience. I would say this, most of you guys, if not all of you guys, you don't pray enough. Thank you, brother. You don't pray enough. If Jesus had to pray to fulfill God's commands, I don't know why you think you can get by without praying. Two things that are essential to where God's going to take you. The Word and the Spirit, praying and fasting. And I don't know why y'all think you can. See, let me, I'm going to tell you what I got caught up in the Spirit and told the intercessional prayer group yesterday. And I would tell it to you because you were not here. Not there. If you don't pray and fast, your words have no might. And the devil won't listen to someone who's speaking the word without might. The might of God is the spirit of God. And the spirit is in the word of God. And if that word is not in you, you can speak the word with no might. But when you speak the word with might, devils listen. And that's why they listened to Jesus. Not only was he the word, he spoke the word, but he had might back enough what he had to say. And that's, what we, that's what's lacking in the church today is the spirit of might. Paul said, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. You will not have the might of God if you're not a person of prayer, fasting, and the word. It's the spirit that gives life to what you have to say. So I may not see you out here on Saturday morning, but if God's going to take you there, prayer should be a part of your life. Because you can speak the word. The people that are not saved can speak the word. But what makes the word alive is when the might of God is in it. So now, you just not quoted that scripture. Let them shout for joy. That favor my righteous cause. Let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure. Say that scripture spoken to me. Now close your eyes. 
Now, Lord, here are these people. You've given these business to these people. You need to repent. Some of you need to repent because you've been robbing God of that tithe. You don't give God anything to work with when you don't give that tithe and that offering and give your hands to God to build his house. You don't give God anything to work with. You got to give God something to work with. Tithing is your divine command. Offering re represents you. Get in the church. Get involved and build God's house and he'll build your house. Now, Lord, the people, you have graced these people with business. Some desire to be in business and they're coming to this altar. Now, Lord, sanctify their heart. Sanctify their soul. Sanctify their mind. Sanctify their conscience. So that they'll sell out to the word. Sell out to the spirit. That your name will be glorified. May the name of the Lord Jesus. May the powers of the risen Christ. Rest upon this man. Rest upon this woman. Rest upon this family. Rest upon this house. In the name of the Lord Jesus. I preach your word to the people. And they have responded to this word. Now Lord be unto them what you said in your word. You give power to get wealth. You teach us how to profit. You establish us in this earth. And we'll prove ourselves to be faithful right where we are. We'll be stewards, faithful stewards in Jesus' name. I lift your hands and say, Lord, I commit my life to you. I commit this business to you. My future is in your hand. And I will prove myself to be faithful. Forgive me for not being committed to the cause of Christ. Forgive me for not being a doer of your word. Not obeying your command. But now I know that you'll take me there. You'll make things happen that I can't make happen. You'll take me places I can't go on my own. I am now committed to the cause of Christ. Now shout for joy. 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 Now listen to me. Now, if you're down here and your wife is not, I want to talk to, I want to pray for all the parents. If you are a married person, or if you're a household head, I want you to come back down here. Stand down here. Now if your wife is out there, say, come on down here, baby, stand beside me. Get beside your husband. Come up here, baby. I want to pray for the families. I want to pray for the families. 2013 is a year of divine progression. But you got to be a doer of the word. You can't ignore the word. God will take you there if you commit to the cause of Christ. Don't ever think that you, it was your hands that got you the will. It was your title, your degree. No, it was the favor of God. Never forget, God took you there. God is going to make it happen. You can. God will make it happen. If you put him first. And close your eyes. Say, Lord, I repent for not obeying your commands. Lord, I repent for not being doers of your word. I repent for not standing up for what is right. I repent for setting the wrong example before my family. I'm not being a man of God. Not being sons and daughters of God. Forgive me for not tithing like I should. Not obeying your commands and giving offer to serving the house of God and building your house. Now, Lord, you have heard the words. Now, fill them with your presence. Anoint this house. Anoint this marriage. Anoint this family. Anoint them with the divine ability, courage, and confidence, and boldness. And to say it out loud, let the Lord be magnified. Say it out loud, let the Lord be magnified. Come. You need to know that scripture like you know the back of your hand. That when the enemy comes in, you'll tell the devil, let the Lord be magnified. Go on. Go on. Put it back up on the screen. They just mumble. 
Put it back up on the screen. Okay, that's okay. You got to learn it. Because when the devil comes, you got to speak the word. You tell the devil what God said. As you move in faith. Let them go back. Let them shout for joy. Come on. Let them shout for joy and be glad. Who favor my righteous cause. Let them say continually. Let the Lord be magnified. Who has pleasure in the... Say it again. Say it again. Let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure. Now say it out loud. That's me. That's me. That's me. See, let me tell you something. Stay right there. Let me tell you something. In the walk of faith, you read the scripture, believe it, take your claim on it. Now, you got to take ownership. You got to take ownership of that scripture. Because there's so much a part of where God has taken you. Because there's going to be seasons of trials and there's going to be seasons of blessing. But when you're going through those seasons of trials, you're going to say. Yes, you're going to have seasons of trials. But there'll be seasons of blessing. You have mountaintop experiences, that's seasons of blessing. But to go to the next level, you got to go down through the valley and climb the next mountain. And when you're going, some of you are going through the valley right now. But while you're going through the valley right now, what do you say? Let the Lord be magnified. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for the Lord is with me. If you're going through a valley of fears right now, shout! this if you don't get some joy your valley experience can take you out because if you don't have joy sorrow has taken over your life and if sorrow takes over your life you start worrying and you start talking down on God you start thinking down on God you start looking down on God and you even drop your head on God but the Bible says, look up for your Redeemer draweth near I will lift my eyes unto the hill from which cometh my help, knowing out there that my help cometh from the Lord. If you don't get some joy, the devil will take you out. How do I get joy? I go to the Word. I go to the rock. And I just simply say what God said. You know when you're on top of the matter because you'll be full of joy and you will shout for joy and you'll be glad. Tell your neighbors, they shorten that season. How do you shorten the season? You get excited. You get excited. Christians don't get angry. Christians get up. 
tell your neighbor, say, don't you sit down on God. Say, I won't let you sit down on God. I had someone call me to listen to you. I had someone call me this morning and say, oh, I'm going to stay home this morning. I ain't feeling good. I said, that ain't a good sign. I said, your faith is stronger than that. I said, your faith is stronger than feelings. Sometimes I don't feel saved. But what do I do? I shout for joy. Yeah, I shout for joy. I shout for joy. You know, I learned that from my mother, Mother Hatch. She's 92. She'll be 92 in June. She said, J.C., sometimes I don't feel like going to church. She said, I'll just get up and go on anyway. And she said, by the time I get there, get in the service, the feelings, the bad feelings is gone. Sometimes you just got to shout when you don't feel like it. Sometimes you got to go when you don't feel like it. Sometimes you got to move when no one else is moving. Come on, guys. Shout it again. Shout it again. Shout it again. Now, now let me say something to you. This is why you can't afford to get down. So if you get down, you can't hear from God. So if you get down, you start focusing on yourself, how bad it is. What you're going through, Lord, why did you let that happen? You got to maintain joy because the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 5.20, God answers us out of the joy of our heart. If the devil steals your joy, you can't hear from God. You become self-conscious. But oh, let them shout for joy. You know what? Sometimes you have to encourage yourself in the Lord. Now, I'm through with you married folks. I want all you single folks come up here. All you single folks. If you're single, get on up here. Yes. Yes. Wonderful change has come over me. Yes, it's come all over me. Yes.
I got a special word for you singers. I heard this in my spirit. You got to change your ways. And this is what I heard the Lord say. Quit getting down because you're a singer. Quit and get, don't allow yourself to get discouraged because you are a singer. Because when you allow yourself to become discouraged because you are a singer, you open up the door for the adversary to make things worse. When you're going through those moments of being alone, don't let the focus be you. Let the focus be Jesus. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. If you have those moments where you feel discouraged, don't slip into that mode. Turn it around. Turn it against the adversary. Don't give in to him. Let it be known. Let the Lord be magnified. You got to learn how to magnify God when you don't feel like magnify God. You got to learn how to magnify God when there's no reason to magnify God. And you'll be amazed what God can do and will do if you maintain a joyful spirit. Now you just now sang the song, I've changed. And tell three people, I have changed. Tell three people. I see you are single-minded. Stop right where you are. I'm not through with you yet. Now close your eyes. Say, Lord, I'm single-minded. Mean I'm God-minded. I'm no longer, no longer self-conscious. I'm no longer self-minded. But I'm single-minded. I'm God-minded. I am one with you. I am in love with you. I focus on my relationship with you. And I believe my relationship with you will qualify me with a relationship with one of your sons and daughters. I am God conscious. I am God minded. I'm never alone as long as I have you. Now Lord, sanctify these singers. Sanctify their mind. Sanctify their conscience. Sanctify them with a special anointing of them knowing that you are with them. And they're singing this is only for a season. And that season is coming to an end. And you will bring that right person to him. That's, listen to me. That singlehood is coming to an end. But you got to prove yourself to God. That you, even if you got married, you still will, he will still be number one in your life. While you're a single, you build that with him. And even after you get married, he still will be number one in your life. Because no man can bring peace. No woman can bring peace, but the God of all peace will keep you in perfect peace if you keep your mind on him. So leave this altar knowing that you are a changed woman. You are a changed